I'm Alan Sangster. Uh, welcome to the County History Course, AC4537. Uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at what is effectively the history of modern accounting. That is, we're going to look at the history of double entry based accounting. And in order to set everything in its place, we need to go back to when it began which is really in me medieval times. And the medieval period went from 476 to 1500. 476 because that's when the Roman Empire collapsed. And 1500, well, it's a date people chose to end the period in or at. So a lot of the emphasis in this course is on that period because it set the tone for what came later. So you'll find that we will focus mainly on the period actually from about 1150 to 1500 and much less on the period from that point forward. And one reason for that, apart from it being when everything originated, was that the way that people did things after that point was simply to put into place what was already possible and just to restructure things, meet new demands that led us to the present day. And we can go over them fairly quickly compared to how much detail we need to speak would devote to the first period, medieval period. Now in this course, there is one textbook that's compulsory because it gives you a background. Now this is a very important piece of background. If you're doing historical work, research or reading about history, learning about history, you need to understand things as historians understand them need to be aware of the issues, the problems, the difficulties that exist in doing historical work. And when you have that understanding, you can see or tell what is good or bad about what you read. The background gives you a whole laundry list of things to think about. It teaches you to think critically, to reflect on what you've seen and ask yourself whether it makes sense. So this book, it's a very short book, is fundamentally important to this course. In the UK, you can get it through Amazon, and that's its current availability price-wise. And you can get it from most online sellers of books, where the main bookstores or bookshops would stock it or be able to get you it very quickly. The book itself has five chapters in it. We're going to focus mainly on the first four. The fifth sort of rounds it all off. And as you will see presently, this book is really something to do before each of the workshops. There is a second book that is, if you like, recommended for this course. It's not a book I would recommend that you purchase, but it's certainly one I would recommend you have a look at. It's optional. Now you look at the price, it's over twice as expensive as the other book. Well, it's at least probably three or four times as big. But if you want to really understand accounting history, 
this book is problematic. And you'll understand it's problematic when you finish this course. And in fact, after you've read Arnold's book, the other book, the recommended book, you will understand why I make this book an optional book. Because it reflects current thinking, particularly in the Anglo world, that's the English speaking world, about the history of accounting. And one thing you'll learn in this course is that the written history of accounting in English is sometimes inaccurate. Now you'll understand that because you know, we will know, how historians think. So what we're hoping to do in this course is to teach you about the history of accounting in a way that stands up, in a way that does make sense. And armed with that knowledge, you should be able to operate better in the real world because you'll understand business so much better. Now, the first three weeks of the course, these are shown here as they will be covered. And I'm showing you this to give you an overview of what's going to happen. In the UK, in Aberdeen, we're going to have objective tests on this course. We'll say a lot more about that uh, in the first workshop. Objective tests, not notionally at nine in the morning. You'll come to understand very soon that that doesn't mean nine o'clock in the morning. It'll be a window when you can take the test. As I say, we'll see more about that in the workshop. Now, you're going to have eight of those tests. And they are based on everything done up to the point when the test takes place. That does not include, for example, in week three, the reading of Arnold chapter three. It doesn't include it. But it includes all of the eight articles that you should have read by then and the two chapters of Arnold that you should have read by then. Now, if you look at the, the reading for the online lecture, this reading should be done before you watch the video. So you should have watched it before you watch this video. So if you haven't already read readings one, two, and three. You should pause this video and go and read them now. To explain what the highlighting means, where the title, if you want, or the description of the article is in blue or as a URL as it is in reading 4 and reading 7 that tells you that you can get this online so for example reading 1 reading 5 and reading 8 are all available through the library's catalogue Primo system, the online system for download. All you would do is, for example, for the first one you'd put uh, in the search field, you put Sangster, the genesis of double entry bookkeeping, and you will be given it the opportunity to download it. For the URLs, if you click on those URLs, or if you type them into a browser, you will come to the article. In the case of number seven there, it's an entire book and the pages to read are 114 to 174. When you download that book, it might default to a strange layout of the pages. You have to change that default, sorry, change the, the view on the document to single page and then it will be perfectly all right. 
The other three that are highlighted in yellow are provided by me and they will be available to you in the course website under the week. So if in week one on the website you will see the two articles highlighted in yellow as available for download. On the left you've got the the week numbers and then you've got uh, that's the week in, weeks of teaching so uh, week one is the first week in which the course is delivered. The readings for online lecture obviously in the third column but in between them is what the lecture is about and this lecture is about establishing the ground rules business needs versus reporting needs and what is double entry bookkeeping and money of account. We're getting into more detail about money of account later in this video. The reason for a double entry and double entry lies at the base of all this it was only when double entry was invented and then developed that we create a foundation on which modern accounting stands. If you take double entry away from modern accounting, you have no accounting. Every accounting system in the planet uses double entry, whether it's manual or computerized. Smaller entities, smaller businesses, sole, sole proprietors, charities, for example, they, they may not use double entry, but they don't do financial reporting like companies do. Double entry was invented to meet the needs of business, not reporting. I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail later in the course, but you have to separate in your head what bookkeeping is from what financial reporting is. Financial reporting didn't really exist until arguably the 17th century. There were um, examples of, of uh, documents or entries made in account books that look, could, could be taken to be a uh, financial reports from earlier periods but it wouldn't be what you would expect today and in fact if you go into the uh, 14th century that is from 13, 1300 to 1399 you get um, some examples of account books which contain reports and you get some examples of reports being extracted from account books. But we're not really looking at those because they were a very, very small minority of activities undertaken by people who were doing bookkeeping. So in this course, you must separate the bookkeeping from the accounting or the financial reporting. And we will, as I say, go into that in more detail later so you really get a very firm idea of what it is that this is all about. Not this week, but very soon we'll be doing that. And what is double entry bookkeeping? Well, you'll learn on this course that every transaction has two elements, an item exchanged and a form of settlement. And double entry records the impact of each of those two things on an, on accounts, one in debit and one in credit. So if the item exchanged, impact of the, on the item exchanged is a debit, the impact on the former settlement is a credit and vice versa. If you take that in, on board, you should be able to get double entry right all the time. So uh, any of you that have a little bit of difficulty with doing journal entries or knowing how to do an adjustment. By the end of this course, you should be able to do it with your eyes shut because that's all to do with bookkeeping and bookkeeping is the primary focus of much of this course. Right, that's enough on that. 
So basically, this is this course is all about where modern accounting came from, and to to actually look at that, you need to look at why and when did double entry start to be used. One thing you must always do when you're doing research, doesn't matter what subject it is, but it's particularly important in history, is that you look at context. And everything about medievalness is situated in its context within a certain perspective, differing between different times, places and people, and in one universal and univocal feature of the period. So when you describe something as occurring in the medieval past, you've got to say where. You've got to say who was involved. You've got to say um, when. You can't just be very generic and just say generally speaking. Because that doesn't apply. Knowledge of context is essential to understand why bookkeeping was done. And for that, you can go way back into the past, way back in the Greek Roman times, way back into uh, 2000 BC, Mesopotamia, Iraq. You, you need context to understand why accounting was or was not done. And you notice I'm keeping them separate because they are two completely separate issues. Knowledge of context is needed to identify bookkeeping's contribution to society or to anything else. And identify accounting's contribution to society. Again, you need context. And it will be the same context, but possibly for different time periods. Okay, so bear in mind, context is essential. So whenever you're looking at anything historical, you think about what was happening at the same time. What was going on in the background? And we'll be going into that in reasonable detail over the coming weeks. If you have one thing about context is to get your perspective right. So we're really going to start around about the 11th, 12th century. And you say to yourself, well, why do we, why do businesses keep records of their trade? Why do they do it? Why do you think they do it? Why does a modern business keep a record of what's happened? Or what is going on? Why doesn't it just buy and sell and not write anything down and then at the end of the day uh, count up its money, put in the, the put aside for the next day the amount of cash it thinks it will need to be able to give change to customers and put the rest in the bank? Or if it's an online business, um, simply just check that it's got enough funds available to make the next set of purchases it needs to make. Why does it bother keeping accounting information? Well, one reason nowadays would be so that you've got something that will enable you to draw up the information you need for the tax authorities. But it was never that was never the case. Um, say in 600 AD or 600 CE. Times things have changed. So why did bookkeeping begin? Well, the thing that stimulated it was trade. This is a map of trade routes in the 11th and 12th century across the then known world, or the world that some people knew. So if you talk to someone, um, in the extreme east they would not know anything about the extreme west but there'd be people at various points along the trails who would know about something further on that they could um, relate so for example if um, I knew that there was a uh, A new product, a new good, or a new some, a new something. So you say some, a new type of fur, available in the middle of Russia. And I was in Italy. 
and I was talking to someone who lived in the UK, I could say, oh, by the way, there's a new type of, of fur available in Russia. Would you like some? And so I would go and arrange for the fur to be delivered all the way to me in Italy, and then I would delay it for, to, uh, deliver it on to the person in the UK. And that's putting everything in a modern context. Imagine in the, in the 11th and 12th century, they didn't have telephones. How did they communicate? They didn't have the internet. So there was no email. There was no, there was no um, social media. There was no newspapers. There was no radio. How did anyone know about anywhere else? But these red lines on the map indicate where trade took place. And along those red lines, goods went out and goods came in. So you could, if you want, uh, send something from London all the way to Japan by passing along the trade route. So trade was, was pretty much developed at that point. Fairly small scale, but developed. And the people involved in that trade had to keep records. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. Now here's an example of the earliest known formalized set of bookkeeping records. It's almost illegible. However, in the 1880s, it was possible to read it. And in the 1880s, it was transcribed and then translated. So we do know what these entries were what they contain, how they are written. You can see this is a, a single sheet of parchment, which is the height of an animal cured and so that you can write on it. It's the main form or the main um, technology used to keep records at that period in Italy and you can see down in the middle there's a vertical line which separates the left hand side from the right hand side. Now that's not debit and credit. It is simply that this is quite a wide piece of parchment and so they have marked it with a vertical line so that they can keep a record that starts at the top, works its way to the bottom on the left and then starts at the top on the right and works its way to the bottom. You might be able to see horizontal lines as the one about halfway down on the left, which marks the bottom of an account. And you can see if you look at the top of the page on the left, just below the date, there is another horizontal line. So that's at least one account fitting into that space. But let's assume it is just one account. And that would be the space where you would fit everything to do with that particular um, relationship. And we'll come on to these later on in more detail. Now in accounting we tend to talk about two forms of bookkeeping more than any other. The first is single entry. And this is what single entry means. It's in Italian. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Francesco Di Giovanni, debit on the 15th of January, 125 Pleri, zero soldi, for 50 pounds of cinnamon at a price of 50 soldi per pound.
and that's it. There's no more information there. There's no indication of account for the contract entry that you'd expect today. And single entry bookkeeping had that characteristic. You look on the right, uh, you see the part payment, uh, which is done by a transfer through the bank, which uh, we would do today on our phones, for example. So you'd make a payment to someone by going into your bank account, uh, setting up a payee, and then sending the 62 lira to that person's account. That's how this payment was done. But there's no mention of the contra entry again. So that's single entry. And this is from an example published in 1525. And this is how we envision, envisage single entry, no contra entry. This is an example of double entry bookkeeping, which is what you should know and be able to do in your sleep by now. So it's um, cash in the hands of Simone D'Alessi Bombeni, debit on 14th November 1493, 62 lira, 13 soldi, 6 denari. And Francesco D'Antoni Cavalcanti in this book at Carta 2, which is page 2. So there you have the indication of where the contra entry is, where the entry is, or the contra entry, whatever. In the account of cash, you've got a contra entry to Carta 2 uh, for the account of Francesco D'Antonio Cavalcanti. And then you see the, his account below it. And he's got a contra entry to Carta 2, which is where the cash account is. So both these accounts are on the same page. So that's the basics. Now we're going to be focusing on that type of thing. But when double entry be first began to be used, it wasn't that clear. Here's more context. We know that markets started to expand in the 11th century. They started to go much, much wider and grow as, uh, in terms of the amount involved as well. But historians for some time were puzzled as to how that was possible. And they were puzzled about that because there was a, a shortage of supply of cash across all of Europe throughout medieval times. In fact, up to, the, up to 1900, there was a, a shortage of cash. And if you get a shortage of cash, how did you, how did you trade? If you're trading anything beyond your um, your normal place of, of residence how did you trade when you went 50 miles away to trade and buy goods to bring back to your town to sell in your town how did you pay for those goods if you didn't have enough cash or let's say you had the cash but you didn't have the right cash so you had sterling, pound sterling instead of um, euros. But generally there was a shortage of cash. And if you, even if you had cash, taking it anywhere was risky. There was plenty of opportunities for someone to, to intercept you on your travel and rob you. Uh, if you took it on a ship, the ship could sink. If you took it any distance, you'd have to be paying for security, you'd have to be paying for insurance. So it became costly as well. And you can bring uh, bullion into this as well, silver and gold. They were in short supply too. So you couldn't uh, say, well, I've no coins, but I've got this lump of gold. I'll take that. Same problem. And cash was valued at its, at its metal content. So if you had a a big bar of gold, which is worth, let's say, a thousand pounds. It weighed the same amount as a thousand pounds of coins, of gold coins. So you didn't, it wasn't any easier to carry lumps of gold as it was to carry bags of coins. In fact, if anything, it was more difficult. There were problems with the alternative, which is barter. 
You're going to read about this in the coming weeks. Barter is where you exchange goods between two, two people. So if I have a sheep and you have a cow and I want your cow and you want my sheep, we'll just swap. Uh, you might want some compensation. I might want some compensation on top of whatever it was. Um, but we'd work it out. But if you didn't want my sheep, how could I get your cow? Well, I'd have to find someone else who wanted a sheep who would give me something you wanted for your cow. It's very problematic. And merchants in medieval Europe who were internationally travelled a long way, they were sometimes faced with a situation, well, I can't get paid, but I can get goods. But I don't know if those goods can be sold back home. I might have to sell them somewhere else, which means going somewhere else. But if I don't do that, I can't sell the goods I've been taken here, even though there is a demand for those goods. So something had to be done to get around these problems. The first thing that happened was that money changers uh, emerged. People willing to take coins from people, convert them into the currency that was used wherever they were or alternatively to assay them the, the coins to, to determine their value so they would take in say um, 10 two pound coins and they check them to see if they were genuine two pound coins or made of plastic um, and back in the days when they were, 100 years ago, when coins were routinely made in silver, they would check the silver content. They would check the coins hadn't been clipped, that is, they hadn't had bits cut off them, which someone was storing in order to, to melt down and just create an ignat of, gold, of silver. The money changers did all that. But when cash was in short supply, the money changers had a problem handing out something in exchange for what they received. The way they got around that, and this is fundamentally important to the history of, of accounting, is they started to operate personal accounts for their customers. They would receive the cash, they would see it, determine what it was worth, and they'd put the amount into an account for their customers. So they created an account for the customer as a creditor. Then when the customer bought something, whatever that was, they would give an IOU to the seller who would take it to the money changer and would either receive cash or would have an account created for him as a creditor. And they debit the account of the person who deposited the money. This was a system of bank money. It allowed trade to take place, even though there was no cash flying about. The money was in the bank ledgers. And because you had a situation where there was enough cash, the only way it could work was if you could transfer amounts from the account of one person to another, which is what we just did. I described what happened when the seller brought the IOU. The seller wasn't given cash, the seller was given an account with a credit balance, which he could then use. And that system is called offset. I'll come back to that list in a minute. If we just pause for a second, how do you record entries in double entry? Well, nowadays we would just use, in the UK, we use um, pounds and pence. So you'd have 10 pounds, 67 pence. You'd write that in your money column. Record that as the value of the transaction. Because the only coins we, the only currency we use in, in this country is, is that, is is the pound. But what happens when you when you buy something from abroad on the internet and you buy say a book from Italy and it costs uh, 27 euros if you're uh, buying it to sell in your bookshop here 
what amount do you put it into your ledger as? 27 euros or some amount of pounds? Well, if you're using double entry, your ledger has to have an entry in there in pounds, not in euros. So you'd put into the entry something like, uh, let's say the name of the book is um, History. So you've got this book called History. Costs you 27 euros. So you'd create, you've got an asset to purchase, but for the moment it's going into your inventory, so it's an item of inventory. And within your account records, you would have one for this book. And it would say, uh, it would be an account, let's create it's an account called History. So you debit that account with an amount in sterling, but in the narrative of the entry in your journal, you would write, um, this book cost 27 euros. You might add to that the exchange rate you used when you're making the entry in sterling. So let's say it was 25 sterling. So this book cost 27 euros converted at um, 1.1 euros to the pound. And then you put the amount 20, which is approximately 25 pounds sterling, but you'd need to find out the right amount. And you put that into the money call. So that when the accounts were all, if you instantly took a trial balance, the trial balance would include that 25 pounds. It wouldn't include the 27 euros. So the money of account we use in today in the UK is sterling. If you go back into the medieval period, you got to look at the reality of what was going on. Remember, there was a shortage of cash. The merchants were the ones who had the big coins. They were the ones that uh, needed them most. In the middle of that paragraph, it talks about coins of account. These are the monies of account. These are where the entries were made with. They have the same names, the same order of magnitude, the same relationship between one and the other. Like, for example, in, in when pre decimalization in the UK in the 1960s, for example, we had one pound equals 20 shillings, and each shilling equals 12 pence. So there's 12 times 20, 240 pennies in a pound. That's the order of magnitude across the various coins. But in medieval period, what do you put in your account books? Well, they might have the same names and the same relationships. They're not the same as the coins that were circulating. There is a link. In bookkeeping, particularly in double entry bookkeeping, you use a single currency or money of account to record transactions. When you went out in the street, however, you'd see other monies of account being used. And none of these monies of account were real. So, and this is an example from Venice, which was not unusual. At the end of the 14th century, if you were looking at wholesale prices, you had four gold-based currencies of monies again, all different in terms of what they were worth. And you had a silver-based one as well, you had a pickling. If you were maintaining a double entry ledger, you had to maintain it in one money of account. So let's say you bought some pepper, some cotton, some cloves and some sugar, you'd have four different monies of account in your purchases, but only one would be used when you put the value of that purchase into your ledger. 
It'll all become clear as we go through the course. But it was complicated. And none of those gold and silver based monies of account actually existed. They were ghost currencies. Ghost monies of account. So merchants had to be able to convert everything into one money of account. Moving forward into the 15th century in Venice, there were only two. They simplified it. And this particular simplification is extremely important to understanding uh, the history of accounting, as you will see in a few weeks' time. You had two main ones. The Lira de Grossi Oro, which was gold-based. The coins are high value. And the Lira de, de Piccoli, which is silver-based, which is much lower value. If you look at the Lira de Grossi Oro, it had four units, Leri, Soldi, Denari and Piccoli, and it was for wholesale and international trade. You wouldn't see it in the shops at the High Street. The Lira de Piccoli is what you saw on the High Street. It comprised the Lira sold in Piccoli, a ratio of 1 to 20 to 12, which is for wages and retail trade. And these names are the same. Lira, Liri, 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 Soldi, Piccoli. But the value of the coins were very different in the two systems. And the Ducata de Oro was the minted coin. And you had a gross in a Piccoli. And their ratios were not 1 to 20 to 12, but 1 to 24 to 32. Now you can see a 32 in the Lira de Grossi Oro, but that was for the fourth coin, whereas in the Ducat de Oro it's for the third coin. So the money was complex, but merchants had to be able to convert everything to a single coin. Now if you're not doing double entry bookkeeping, you don't need to do that. So once people started putting the same currency into the column for money, it was a step towards getting uh, enterprise-wide double-entry bookkeeping systems. It was also what facilitated the, the use of bank money, because the banker who's got multiple currencies in his ledger for each customer is going to find it difficult to move things from one customer to another, whereas standardising on one uh, money of account made that easy. Now going back to points to note, all this adoption of bank money fed through into business. So businesses started to deal in credit a lot. This whole process had a multiplier effect on markets because money would circulate round and round. And you'll see an example when you read the first paper. Well, you will have seen when you read the first paper of uh, an entry in a ledger account in 1211 that involves, I think, from memory, it's five different people. So the multiplier effect, that money had passed through five different sets of hands. And this multiplier effect enabled the markets to expand. So money would circulate. The, the money changers who became bankers, once the acting as the middleman became a key part of their business. They would invest the money that was deposited with them, either in buying goods of their own to sell or just in or in property or in something else. So the money circulated within the market, but the, the banks could use it for other things. So there was an expansion in all senses across economies. And this impacted local trade, regional trade and international trade. Now, just to finish off, in the uh, 13th and 15th century, Europe was really split into two zones. There was the North, which was controlled. Controlled is not the right word, but it was. It, it, there was a very prominent um, influence in the North from the Hanseatic League which was formed in the early 13th century. 
it's a collection of it's a it's a it's a cooperative of merchants and each of theirs and the, each of their cities was or towns was looked on as a member of that league although it was actually the merchants who were the members and it effectively orchestrated or controlled how trade was done in its region you see in a minute uh, a snapshot that looks very closely at that but they were very inward looking um, not terribly interested in, in travelling to goods they wanted the goods brought to them and a similar thing applied for example in, in Great Britain where it was very um, inward looking parochial and you could almost say it's suspicious of foreigners and that was the north in the south it was controlled by Italy trade in the south completely controlled by Italy and they were adventurous they went they traveled everywhere they took the goods to the customers and it was the Italians that made Europe an international market so the final thing on this topic for today the Hanseatic League. This is basically where it existed. So it's right across the north of Europe. Now you can see where it is by the circles, the important, less important, and the key. It spread across the north, which meant that it, it had a, obviously a access to sea routes. And it was because of access to sea routes that it came to, to, into existence in the first place. But it also went, uh, it also travelled uh, south on rivers and east on rivers, west on rivers, as well as using the, the sea. But it stopped, if you look at the, the left of that map, it stopped um, right about Sluish. Um, above Antwerp and, and Bruges. But you also see there a triangle above Bruges, a triangle beside London. And there's also a triangle up on the top right. These were its contours. The contours are, are towns outside the area of the Hanseatic League that acted as its entrepots. They are places where trade happened. So goods would be taken across the Hanseatic Lake to the uh, contour. So that might be north into Oslo or might be uh, west into Bruges or across to London and trade would take place there. So that's how they operated. And the South came up to meet them, and I'll be getting into that in much more detail next next few weeks. So that's the, the end of the video. Make sure that you've read the first chapter of Arnold's book before you attend the workshop. It'll be assumed that you have. It's not expensive, but you really do need to read it. So don't put it off. Don't wait for the library to have copies because the library will probably only get um, one or two electronic licenses. Just go and buy it. It'll be well worth investing in it.